Hello, members of Mount Zion. I am here in the nave of our church as we are getting ready to celebrate Holy Week. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that we are almost to that time of the church year already, especially in the midst of this pandemic where the days seem to be dragging so slowly and time seems to be just a little bit disoriented. And yet this Sunday is Palm Sunday, and so Holy Week begins. You know, as we live now in this time of fear of disease, it is quite appropriate for us to be focusing on Jesus' passion, his bodily suffering and death for us. And we especially call to mind the words of Scripture where it is written about Jesus, he himself took our sicknesses and bore our diseases. See, when Jesus healed someone, it wasn't as if he was just performing a magic trick or something. He was actually taking away and taking upon himself those ailments. On the cross, he bore all of our sins and all of our sicknesses too, so that their power would be destroyed in his death. All of our prayers for healing are answered, yes, in Jesus, whether we experience that healing now or in the resurrection of the body on the last day. And that's why we take special comfort in Jesus' passion. That's why we call Good Friday good, especially in times like these. So as we enter into this most holy week of the year, and since we are not going to be able to gather in our usual way this year, I thought this would be a good time to do a devotional meditation and explanation of a wonderful painting that we are blessed to have here at Mount Zion to help us to ponder the saving mysteries of Christ's passion. That painting that we have here as you enter into church is entitled Ecce Homo, and it is painted by Edward Riojas. It's a piece of artwork that's beautifully rich in color, but also and especially beautifully rich in theology and meaning. And I want to take just a few moments to draw your attention to some of those particulars of this painting that are worth meditating upon, particularly at this time of year. First of all, you can see the, uh, the title of the painting etched very lightly into the stone right below Jesus' feet, the words Ecce Homo, which are Latin for Behold the Man. Now, those words were spoken by Pontius Pilate, and he spoke them right after Jesus had been beaten and, and flogged and, and whipped. And so you can imagine uh, how these words were really more sarcastic and mocking than anything else. Behold the man, look at this guy, all bloodied and beaten. And yet for us as Christians, uh, Pilate really speaks a wonderful truth here. Behold the man, here is the one who exhibits perfect manhood, perfect masculinity, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, willing to suffer and die in order to save and redeem his elect lady of the church. Sacrificial love, self-giving, is the perfect mark of manhood and masculinity, and here we see it in its perfection. Christ Jesus uh, laying down his life for us uh, in order to save us. One of the other things you note right away about the painting, of course, is the uh, statement at the bottom here, his blood be on us and on our children. This was spoken by the crowd that was gathered before Pontius Pilate. Uh, Pontius Pilate was one who was not eager to take responsibility for Jesus' death. And so the people basically said, all right, we'll be responsible, we'll be accountable. His blood be on us and on our children. Crucify him, put him to death. Those words, uh, as hateful as, as they were, uh, we can take as Christians as being wonderful gospel words, wonderful words of, of, of truth, of what we desire. Yes, his blood be on us and on our children uh, in a saving way. For the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us of all sin. 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 7. That blood of God, the blood of Christ, is on us in our baptism, sprinkled on us uh, to cleanse us. And of course, the blood of Christ is in the chalice in Holy Communion, uh, that we might receive it given and shed for the forgiveness of sins. So these words do remind us of our own accountability uh, because of our sin, but much more they remind us that uh, the life of God is in the blood, and it is a blood which gives us life, which cleanses us, which forgives us. His blood be on us and on our children. At the top of the painting, you'll see words written in Hebrew, and those words come from Exodus 24, verse 8 says, And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you, 
concerning all these words. So those Old Testament sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, the blood was collected, sprinkled upon the people as well as upon the altar as a sign of that covenant relationship that God had with his people, that they belonged to him, that they were his own, that their sins were covered, uh, and so forth. Uh, of course, in the Old Testament, it was only animal sacrifices. Here now we have the sacrifice of God himself in the flesh. The animal sacrifices pointed forward to, the, to a fulfillment in Jesus who brought an end to all sacrifices by his once for all perfect sacrifice for us on the cross. As we zoom in a little bit closer here again, I want you to pay special attention to the crown of thorns that is on Jesus' head. You'll notice uh, something a little bit uh, unusual, how the, the thorns, uh, one thorn protrudes straight upward and two thorns protrude straight outward to either side. That is purposeful and it's a hearkening to the, uh, the, the technique that was used in icons and, and much other sacred art to signify deity. It's the triradiant nimbus that's uh, used to show the deity of the Son of God. An example of that I have here on another icon where you see Jesus portrayed uh, with not only the halo behind him, but that triradiant nimbus uh, pointing upwards and outwards with the, the Greek letters ho on, which means uh, the living one, uh, the, the God, the uh, true God, the creator. And so that triradiant nimbus is used not of saints, but only, only of Jesus, uh, the Son of God. That signifies deity. And so as we look at the crown of thorns, what a wonderful way of showing that here is the deity, hidden beneath weakness and suffering to be sure, but nonetheless in, in, a, in a rather spectacular way, showing forth the glory of his love, willing to, to sacrifice himself for our sins. Of course, the crown of thorns is also significant of itself, uh, in general, uh, you remember that one of the curses that was spoke to Adam in the beginning was that the ground would bring forth thorns and thistles, uh, would not be easily tilled. Here Jesus takes that sign of the curse and literally wears it. He bears the curse for us so that he might break the curse uh, by his suffering and death and resurrection. And so the crown of thorns uh, is of special note here. Uh, God the Son in the flesh showing forth his glory, breaking the curse on our behalf. Perhaps something else to notice here in this painting, you see not only the blood that is shed for us, uh, spattered across uh, Jesus' garments, but also the bruising. And uh, we are reminded that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Uh, wonderfully portrayed there, realistically portrayed, um, and yet in a, uh, in a reverent sense, how our Lord, by his wounds, by his bruising, by his blood, has purchased our salvation. Uh, something else to take note of in this, in this painting is the garment that Jesus wears. We know from the scriptural account that the Roman soldiers mockingly put a, a scarlet or purple robe upon Jesus uh, and, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And here that is reflected in one sense, but also uh, the artist took some liberties um, to bring out a, an, a, another theological point as well. Um, the artist has put upon Jesus' shoulders here the temple curtain. And uh, I read from his own description of this painting. Without use of further daily sacrifice beyond Christ's redemptive sacrifice, the temple became useless. The curtain that once hid both the sin of mankind and the glory of God now rests on the shoulders of the Christ, his glory absorbing the punishment for our sin once and for all. And so here, in a sense, we are given a glimpse behind the temple curtain, which was torn in two from top to bottom uh, when Jesus died. Here we are given to see uh, the glory of God once hidden behind that curtain, now being unveiled and seen in Christ. Uh, Jesus himself said, uh, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And so here we, we have the very temple of God, the place of God's presence, uh, here for us in the flesh of Christ, offered up for us on the cross, and now risen from the dead uh, in glory. Perhaps one other thing to, to wrap this up, uh, and this is something that goes beyond maybe what the, uh, what the artist intended, I don't know, but if you look at the lighting uh, in this 
uh, in this uh, painting, you'll see that it's coming from two directions. It is coming from below. You see that, especially if you look at the pillars, that the, the shadows are being cast upward. And yet there is also light that's coming from above. As you look at the nose and the arms of Jesus, the, the, the shadows are being cast downward. And maybe there's a, a little a twofold meaning in that. On the one hand, as you look at the background in particular, you see that reddish orange, it, it evokes flames, it evokes fire, evokes fire. And uh, is a reminder certainly of the judgment of hell that Jesus suffered for us and on our behalf. Uh, Jesus would literally go through hell for us as he cried on, on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so that, that fiery light from below is a reminder of what Jesus was, uh, was stepping into for us and, and on our behalf. On the other hand, we also see the light coming from above, uh, that divine light uh, which not only shines on Jesus but shines from Jesus. For he says, I am the light of the world. And he is the one who has come to conquer the darkness for us. He quite literally entered into the darkness for us going even to the, to the grave on our behalf uh, and then destroying the darkness from the inside out, rising upon the third day. And so here we see uh, that light and that, and that glory of God again shown uh, in suffering. Jesus' foot, I forgot to mention, is also covered here. Perhaps the covering of feet, a, a sign of, of humility, this humility of Christ willing to go through this for us. We see how Jesus is bound uh, and how the rope, we don't know who's holding the rope. Um, in one sense, of course, uh, the rope is held by all of us. We are all guilty of causing the necessity of our, our Savior's death. And yet he is our Savior. Because he died because of our sins, he also has taken away our sins in his death. And that is our sure and great hope in Christ, what we celebrate through Holy Week and, and all, all the church year long. So behold the man, here is Jesus, your suffering Savior, the one described in 1 Timothy chapter 2 where it is written, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, a ransom for you. May God grant to all of you a blessed holy week.